Hi everybody, Dr. Friedman here. This week, we're kind of coming full circle all the way back to the concerns of our first couple of weeks of class, which is to say, how do you write about role-playing games? And in part, we're coming back to this because the submissions have now all come in for my post-45 contemporaries cluster on actual play, live streaming, tabletop role-playing, and very long narratives now. And so now I've got some important editorial work to do. And whenever I'm doing research like this, I find it really valuable to include my students in that process, to show them how the sausage is made. How do editorial decisions get made? What makes for a compelling proposal when you don't have the full paper in front of you? And so this was a great week to bring my friend and colleague, Evan Turner, who's one of the co-founders of Analog Game Studies, a important peer-reviewed journal in this space, into the classroom to talk about his long career thinking about this. Like me, um, Evan went to grad school and kind of never could entirely free himself from his fandoms, and in fact, uh, has had this amazing career both thinking about German cinema, but also doing this important uh, work in terms of uh, Nordic LARP, uh, in terms of tabletop role-playing games. He's been, as you'll see from our discussion, he has kind of had his hands in a whole bunch of projects and has run an enormous number of games at Origins and Gen Con, among many other venues. And so we're also direct contemporaries, uh, so it was useful to kind of talk about that. And what I really like about talking to Evan, who is a friend of my dear friend Carrie, who, who kind of brought us together when I started working in this field, is that we have complementary um, interests in this field. Um, and so it's such a privilege uh, to have Evan be one of the sages available to my students. At the end of this video, which uh, will include the entire conversation that we had with Evan Turner, he says, this, is, this class is a once in a lifetime opportunity for my students. I hope it's not a once in a lifetime opportunity for me, of course, um, but this has been a very special kind of moment. Uh, so today, students had lots of questions around um, mechanics, what makes for um, the signs that a game could be compelling if you're judging it, um, or if you're trying to decide to, whether to play it or run it as a one-shot, because Evan runs a lot of one-shots, um, for strangers in these kinds of convention spaces. And then at the very end, about the last 15 minutes of this video, I had us pivot to thinking about a similar way of assessing uh, journal articles or, or proposals for journal articles. Because on Thursday, students will be taking a look at anonymized pitches from the Post 45 call and talking in small groups about which uh, proposals they think are the most compelling. And as Evan told our students, it's important for those kinds of proposals to be specific, um, to have uh, a firm grounding in the kind of conversation that the, the proposal wants to contribute to, and it needs to be pushing forward some kind of new insight. Uh, it doesn't have to be groundbreaking and it doesn't have to be enormous, but it does need to kind of get us further down the road in some aspect of the field. And this is where I tell you that today at the time of this recording is also the day that Analog Game Studies is putting out its latest special issue all on the Fiend Folio, um, which I can't believe is as old as I am. Uh, it is the 40th anniversary of the Fiend Folio, which is a fascinating case um, that can be looked at from the kind of history of the development of the game, its larger cultural impact on monster design, the ways in which uh, these uh, fiends represent uh, gender, um, connections to Lovecraftian racial politics, um, 
and also just thinking about uh, the ways in which this thing was produced and how it was made. Uh, it's an incredibly rich uh, set of essays with a hell of an introduction by um, the editorial uh, curating eye of, um, uh, of the uh, invited editor, which is kind of amazing. Um, so I highly recommend it. I'll put the link in chat. Uh, for those who are interested. Um, but yeah, so this is all by way of introduction, as you can see from the length of this video, to a full conversation with Evan Turner. Luckily, uh, in in this one of our kind of, as we get to the end of our Zoom uh, kind of conversations for the semester, I have finally figured out how to set the Zoom settings in our classroom so that whenever I talk, the whole classroom isn't seen. Um, for those of you that are interested, it's spotlighting. Once you spotlight someone, they are the only thing that Zoom recordings, at least here, uh, will notice for the entire time that they are on the call. So that's gonna be really useful um, in our final conversations. Just uh, as a heads up to my students who are joining us, because of course this is what is class about, uh, just a reminder that this week students are still checking in with me about their um, mid-semester check-ins for their contracts. Uh, so we've been doing a little bit of adjusting that way. Next week, we're going to be watching Talis and Jaffe's one-shot um, Shadow of the Crystal Palace as our Cthulhu week kicks off. And that will also include our first in-person visitor, um, actor London Carlyle, who luckily, uh, while he is primarily New York City based these days, is playing sold out shows at the Alliance right now. So he's able to bop over to hang out with us and talk about his career as a um, part-time streamer who's a theater actor, a stage actor most of the time, and also who is of the generation closer to my students and what it's like to be kind of an aspiring uh, actual play streamer in this space, working primarily in the kind of horror realms. So I've said this before, but I'm just going to keep bragging because that's what these videos are for. As always, feel free to put questions down in the comments below, or you can tweet at me at Freed, F-R-I-E-D-E. And I'll see you on Thursday for a discussion, a much shorter discussion, about how our activity of looking at academic pitches went. Take care. And community, which, you know, <laughs> what is critical role? <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly. Like all of these other, I mean, it's a fascinating assessment of, you know, all of these streamers, like you have to, somebody actually did a Twitter thread where it's like, I'm going to scroll down the top 50 until I find someone who isn't a dude. And they had to get to like, or like streamer 33 or I, I know, I think it was actually in the forties. Um, but yeah, so, uh, so no, so yeah, past, present, future. We are at time. Welcome guys. Time. Let's, let's do it. Let's yeah. do this thing. Um, so as usual, uh, we've got, so, so what you can't see Evan, but what I can see is, um, I use a Mentimeter poll to check on how people are doing. And we've got lots of feelings, as you know, as an educator, um, you know, this is a time of big feelings for us all stress. Uh, sleepy, test stress, uh, but some joy. Um, and also somebody really hustled the class, so they're winded. Um, we've got a couple people who are refreshed. Um, and so that's gonna keep, um, the other thing that's in the Mentimeter poll that I'm gonna have in front of me and that the students will be also be able to see is um, they're gonna ask questions. They can also like raise their hand and ask a question and look to the camera and wave if they want to. Um, but we found that the weirdness of Zoom has meant that often it's just, you know, fa me facilitate. So you are, you are allowed to go on as long as you want. This is story time. And right. so just a reminder, like I'll do a little brief introduction. Um, I mentioned this on Twitter. So some of my students have already seen that, have already seen this, but when I started working on this class and started working in game studies, I have a friend who's an 18th centuryist who's also a kind of game enthusiast. She, she's an expert in 
18th century philosophy, right? Like very, and math. But she said, you know, you should talk to my friend, Evan. And here's my friend, here's now my friend, Evan. Um, exactly. Evan Turner is uh, one of the founding editors of Analog Game uh, Journal, which you guys have been reading extensively from both us together as a collective. And we've got a potential like contract task where students can pick articles to read and I was just this morning taking a look at some of those like annotations of where they break down how the article was constructed, what kind of evidence they're using. And so I thought he would be a great resource for a couple of reasons. One is he's an editor of a journal in this field and we're gonna spend Thursday kind of putting that hat on so to speak um, and thinking about what makes for a compelling academic pitch, right? Or in our case, it's going to be kind of academic, but also public, but same principles apply. But the other thing I really love um, from talking to Evan is that he's got this parallel lore knowledge, knowledge of the history of both game studies and game practice that like runs in parallel to my own. We are basically the same age, but we have been mining different fields. We've been playing different games we've been doing it in different kinds of spaces. So how many games have you run in how many cons in your in your time in the salt mines? Uh, it, uh, quite a few, but I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have, uh, I, I basically decided I'll just open a few web pages on my, um, my laptop as my presentation as it were, but yes, I think <laughs> it is, is effectively, um, you know, a life's work in, in game mastering for random strangers, mostly. I think it's really important to know that, that like my, my usual context is not a home campaign, but is running for complete strangers who've paid money to sit down and play my games. Yeah, so we've talked to, um, you know, B. Dave and Abria who have done that kind of professional game running in the context of performance. But for you, this is about bringing people together, not as spectacle, but as experience and through a lot of different kinds of uh, different games, uh, some of which we're, we've played and some of which we haven't yet. Uh, if, if you remember, we played last week, um, The Quiet Year, I think, as you know, Evan, and you were the one to be like, oh yeah, For the Queen, which we played in the first week is totally a hack of, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no. Yeah, you are slightly, it is slightly blurry, but we're good. <laughs> yes, love the street cred. Um, you do have, if you'd like to screen share, you do have that authorized. All right, great. Um, so I think let's, let's see if I can um, do this correctly because I've got my tabs open, but then I've also got my other tabs open. And so let me- You have all the tabs. Let, so let me make tabs. sure I don't, I don't share the porn with you. There we <laughs> go. And there, no, <laughs> this is, this is, um, this is the current web page I've got uh, from the my first con, which is, is still on, ongoing. So this is uh, GammaCon uh, Gallium, which is the latest in, iteration of GammaCon run in Iowa City. Uh, my first convention was in 1995. I was in, I think it was the start of eighth grade at the time. Um, and it was, it was run at a... Um, military arsenal it was at the, the the national guard arsenal armory so so we, we you know we're sitting there next to like supply trucks and whatever uh playing dungeons and dragons my first game was a hack of uh the brian jake's Redwall series made for gurps the generic universal role-playing system that would then in the same year become the bedrock of a familiar game to you uh known as fallout in the fallout series um you know, it's built on GURPS. Uh, I, I built this Redwall game on GURPS. It was not that great, but the, the thing I learned there, of course, was uh, that, that if you have a great play group who's all on board and, and it was multi-generational, right? I had my 13-year-old, 14-year-old friends there and I had 30-year-olds who were having just as good of a time and I thought this is transformational. Actually, I was quite addicted to the intergenerational spaces where it felt like you know people could bring their kids, 
Uh, people could, you know, go off and have adult uh, crazy LARP time, or they could go and play a chill board game out in, in the main um, uh, board gaming area. And, and that kind of egalitarian space uh, stuck with me. And I think I always keep seeking places where status politics, where age politics, where, uh, you know, people with, with disabilities, with, with people, um, uh, you know, who uh come from from marginalized backgrounds definitely women are, are all are all welcome and can be there and play and enjoy each other's company and and and, and not be limited by uh you know sort of the basics of the space or also its social complexities so probably about 15 years later um i was involved with this um independent game development scene in western massachusetts where i was doing my grad school work I was getting real distracted from working on East German cinema by the fact that I could play games with some of the luminaries of the indie scene at the time, including Emily Kerr Boss, Julia Ellingbow, uh, Joshua A.C. Newman, and of course, Vincent and Meg Baker. I was in the second Apocalypse World campaign. Yeah. So if you're talking about powered by the apocalypse in this, of course, it's like, you know, that's it. And I, I should also reveal that I'm working on a book on apocalypse world because I've been contracted. They said, here, you need to write a oh, book. Is that, the, is that the Michigan book? Yes, it's a Michigan book. So, so I'm, I think I'm the only RPG in there. And, and, I, and I thought, yeah, okay, well, better be an important one. And, and it's cool that a game that, you know, I was sort of there at ground zero has now become important, but it's not, it's not random. There's nothing, there's not, there's nothing random about that happening. Yeah, for, for the folks in the room who were Adventure Zone friends, uh, fans, um, when they don't play D&D, they've been playing largely powered by the apocalypse based games. I think yeah. that's right. They were the ones who popularized Monster of the Week, which was just yes. one of many different uh, Powered by the Apocalypse games. And of course, with Adventures and playing it, it skyrocketed into prominence. Uh, yes. I, think, I think the game is decent. I think it's pretty good. I think I like Sagas of the Icelanders and Monster Hearts better, but it's the same thing that happened to Dungeon World, which is another Powered by the Apocalypse game. It kind of, you know, it did its thing and then suddenly it got an audience and it... It, it exploded so i've been watching lots of cool things take off uh in my career and may, maybe i'm less excited now than i used to be when watching cool things take off but uh it, it's because again if you know how the sausage is made it's just people doing their their creative thing in, a, in these these climates so then again about 15 years later um thanks to catherine and michael miller uh working at dreamation in new jersey uh, they invented a thing called Indie Games Explosion, which we turned into Indie Games On Demand. And this is, again, our egalitarian space. You come to a convention, and we have hacked the convention so that we have a little mini convention in the convention where we control the rules and not the convention. And, and in this case, uh, the goal of, of Indie Games On Demand, which I've co-organized at Origins for many years, is just to uh, make sure that um, small press games get to be run. And, you know, it, it, it comes from a, a place where people used to be running their independent games out of the Forge booth or a couple of other um, organizations, the Ashcan Front, et cetera, at Gen Con. And that was in the late, you know, mid to late 2000s. And that meant you were always like running in a crowded exhibitor hall for people who are maybe going to play your game for 10 or 20 minutes. You guys have played role playing games now. It does, you can't do it in 10 or 20 minutes. That's not viable. But what if you had a nice, quiet room where you say, you know, oh, you know, I know so and so is going to be on the slot at 2 p.m. Why don't you go and see if you can demand this game from them? Well, suddenly we now have a relationship. So, uh, indie press revolution, um, bully pulpit games, and a number of other well known um, presses, and actually Magpie Games, which is Avatar The Last Airbender. Uh, Kickstarter for $9 million. They were also part of our space. Um, you know, Mark Diaz Truman came to Games on Demand in 2011, having pu published nothing and, you know, it was sit sipping PBR in a bar. And that was, that was how I met Mark Diaz Truman. And I was like, man, this guy's hipster trash. But he also, uh, you know, has a Harvard MBA. And as I got to know Mark, I thought, hmm, actually, he's really, really smart and knows exactly what he's doing and has a 10 year plan and 10 years later now he's you know he ran the, the highest 
you know, multi-million dollar Kickstarter. So if you look at this and you say, oh, well, these are just a couple of people like running games in a room, it's half true. But it, it's also true that that a lot of careers were started through this, right? Where, where effectively um, people come to a slot, they look at some menus and say, ooh, what, what games are on offer? I don't know any of these titles, but you'll have like some artwork and a little description and uh, you know, maybe two people have already signed up for that game. And so you know it'll actually run if you decide to sign up for it. And then you just jump in and, and you, you know, sit down and play it for two or four hours. And that seems to be the formula. And so our main motto with Games on Demand is to support our game masters at all costs, right? Even it, It's a lie. People can't come in and demand games. No, that's not the case. What they can do is they can choose from a very limited selection so that the game masters no matter what will be running something very high quality in that space for a chosen audience that that also kind of knows the score so this is a great recipe for community building we try not to make it into a click but a community and always welcome people from from the outset oh i i also i'm really involved with live action role play i got into larp I don't know if you've, you've discussed LARP a lot or not. We, we've uh, talked a little bit about it, but of course not done it. Uh, so I'm going to give you about five minutes of LARP because it's really important to who I am. Uh, I did some crappy LARPs in college, vampire LARPs in 2000 to 2002, and did not like them. I wrote a two-page uh, nasty letter saying why I was quitting you know, Vampire the Masquerade LARP and made my game masters cry. Years later, we're still friends, but <laughs> it was it was definitely not a nice parting in in college. And uh, eight years later, I I went to an event called Fastival in Denmark, and this is you know my Fastival catalog at Alexandria.dk. Um, First of all, is a uh, small convention, maybe oh, maybe 400 people, um, and takes place mostly in a school it'd be, it'd be over Easter weekend. So everybody's gone. And in Denmark, you can just rent a school. Why not? And um, there, you would write games specifically to be run by other people in that space. And they would be run by four or five other game masters over the course of the weekend. And then they would be up for prizes. So I got to play um, Cormac McCarthy's The Road, The LARP <laughs> in 2010. Oh my God, that sounds incredibly depressing, yeah. but I guess that's par for the course it, in that it, space. And, and, and this is a game that has extremely channeled agency. So you really can't do much to affect the plot line. Things are going to go badly and die and your characters are gonna make decisions that you don't agree with. So what do you do? Well, this was actually written in what's called Jeep form, which is a, avant-garde Swedish Danish um, uh, hybrid LARP role-playing game thing I can I can talk about but in end effect I played this very emotionally powerful experience and to some degree the group that we had for that game still we still run together and and and, and plan things to, it was like we fused together into this collective at that moment of time and and I can't explain it, but that's what happened. Um, simultaneously that weekend, I got to play um, a game called Previous Occupants, another uh, Jeep form game. It's set up for um, uh, groups of two and two. They're both inhabiting the same hotel room. One is a young couple about ready to have sex for the first time. They're Christian, ultra Christian, and, and are not supposed to be having sex before marriage. They definitely will. That's part of the scenario. And then the other uh, uh, two people are in the same hotel room uh, years earlier, and it's an older elderly couple, and one of them will kill the other one. And in the, in the second half, half, the elderly couple come in and inhabit the bodies of the young couple <laughs> as they try to figure out their confused emotions after, after copulating. Uh, I also got to play in Sense and Sensibility, the LARP, who was just growing up by Anna Vesterling. As, as, and I'm like, Really, really, and I, I played through this game, and I thought this is this is actually pretty interesting. And and I and I started making all these choices, and then I was playing Colonel Brandon. I had a lot of money. I wanted, you know, I, I wanted to be like upstanding, but also wanted this girl. And then and then I read the book afterwards and thought, holy crap, we just played we played the book verbatim, and I made the same decisions that Colonel Brandon did. 
I, I totally dueled Willoughby. I was like, okay, you know, the, everything, everything played out. And, and that's where I thought, okay, I'm a, I'm a literature and film professor. This is, this is powerful stuff. So immediately I wrote up a, a game based off of Fritz Lang's Metropolis on the train ride home. And, you know, and it sort of went on from there. I've got Metropolis, the LARP, Run Lola Run, the LARP, uh, Uwe Boll's Big Gay Wedding. So we're doing a terrible Uwe Boll style um, video game film. <laughs> uh, it, it's a, actually, actually a, a, a gay wedding film. Um, I was involved with the hashtag feminism collection by Lizzie Stark and Misha Bushyager. Um, and, uh, and then, and then I started writing a lot more, uh, sort of, uh, gay polyamorous games. So I now have the Intrepid Seven, where you are a space co a colony of seven people coming and terraforming, uh, your, your planet with your, your, your sexual interactions, uh, save some light for me where you're all really strange, like He-Man style characters who are battling this ultimate evil and forming a weird relationship. And I'm working on a sequel to that called Diamond 20, which is a card based version of that. So I've got a very strange design background. Again, I kind of went from more standard role playing games and jumped off the deep end and I've never looked back. I love the deep end. It's great. Uh, I was part of the co-organizing team for Just the Little Lovin', which was a, um, a, a very legendary LARP about um, uh, people dying of AIDS in the early 1980s, right? You, you play three consecutive 4th of July parties, uh, 1982, 83, and 84 as a LARP. Uh, each each day is a different Fourth of July party, and you watch as the social circle changes as people die and relationships break up, people hook up with the wrong people, etc. Uh, this is the best game ever written. It just came out in book form, and I can encourage you to read it. And I don't know, get sixty people to play her in five days. I don't know, but it's it's, it's definitely <laughs> one of the best games I've ever played or written. And you know, I I again was in part of this very inspirational. Nordic LARP community after um, I sort of uh, left the Western Massachusetts community for career reasons. And now I write for nordiclarp.org um, where I've got a number of articles on various LARP related topics. I run a challenge called the Golden Cobra Challenge where we, we look for um, new small freeform LARPs. Again, freeform being you don't have to wear a big costume. You can just play it in your classroom right now if you want to, or, or over um, Zoom or whatever. So we, um, we're, we're running this, this contest right now. There will be contest results at the end of Metatopia. And finally, finally, we're going to get to what you wanted to all talk about, analog game studies. Same year as we founded uh, Golden Cobra to meet some needs at Gen Con. Um, to make to, to kind of make LARPs for that. Um, that same year, 2014, we also founded uh, Analog Game Studies, and that was with Aaron Trammell and Emily Waldron. Uh, our purpose there was that we were dissatisfied that game studies was so video game based, that all of us had expertise that was just not valued. Um, that, that we had played uh, you know, a lifetime of board games, LARPs, tabletop RPGs, but everybody wanted to talk about Bioshock. And Bioshock is cool, but there are more to life than Bio Bioshock. And you have to imagine from my perspective, right, where I'd played all these very powerful games from the Nordic context and really had my, my brain radically altered by both North American and Nordic role play theory, that then I had to go back to games conferences where they <laughs> would, would be like, this is the first game to have this sort of emotional appeal to, you know, I mean, I'm like, no, that's bullshit. That, you can't say that. And, and that's where I really got to a point where, um, where this journal was possible. Um, most of my projects come from anger, uh, that, that, that I'm, I'm mad about something and I, I get I get worked up and I start pouring citations together and suddenly an article appears. And this is a journal produced out of anger for me where I could say, look, you know, we, we, we want a space where, where we can talk explicitly about tabletop RPGs, explicitly about LARPs, explicitly about board games and card games. And, and also we talk about video games and other things, but it just has to have a, like a non-digital component. So um, that's taken the, form of location-based gaming. It's taken the form of analyzing, um, you know, people's uh, game setups at home, like, you know, what chairs they sit in and that sort of thing. It's taken the form of cocktail cabinets, 
um, that's the video game side of things. But most of the time, we are just talking about board games, talking about RPGs, and um, and trying to get, a, of course, um, a mixture of material from uh, designers themselves and non non academics, uh, junior scholars, as well as senior scholars. So if we look at the, the recent uh, Fiend Folio issue, um, we have six, um, we have six different articles by um, uh, six different invited authors and and the editor Tom Apperly also wrote a seventh article effectively with the overview of what the Fiend Folio is. And I'm not going to go into everything about the Fiend Folio unless you want me to, but to some degree, it was a hyper-specific topic. But as we now know from 40 years later, this is an incredibly influential piece of crowdsourced monster creation. And it's kind of where a lot of the, not only what we call the gonzo monsters are, the, the really weird ones, but also the ones that violate um, the player dungeon master contract. That, that effectively, you know, these are the ones that like drain your levels, ruin your crap. Uh, the crypt thing will like randomly teleport you away. Who, who comes up with this stuff? But of course, you know, that way, that way it, 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 it's all a magic trick, right? So your dungeon master says the, the crypt thing reaches out and oh, he hits you and you, you vanish. And all of the players are like, did they die? Well, no, they didn't, they, you know, they got teleported some random place. They're still, they're still screwed. They're still somewhere else in the dungeon. They shouldn't be there, but they didn't instantly die <laughs> like they thought. So, so oh, you can, no. you, 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 I guess you can, you can see all of this, this bit of, um, uh, uh, of homebrew wizardry. And I think that that, when I, when I get into role-playing games, and this is sort of my last point before we open things up, um, role-playing games are fundamentally a folk art form. They are not, uh, 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 corporations can roll out big splat books, but it always sort of belongs to quote unquote the people because they ultimately they're the ones who do things with it. it, it things are not locked away by code or, or by technical ability. Um, although it, it does take those skills to be a streamer and other, other things, but, but fu fundamentally, if you're just sitting around at the table deciding to play a role-playing game, um, all it is is regulating how you speak to each other. You know, what, is, what counts as fiction, what counts as not fiction, what's, what, what's a rule discussion, what is a in-game discussion, right? All of that is, is what a role-playing game regulates. And, uh, and, and that, that comes from you, that comes from, from, from the people. And in my several decades of dealing with role-playing games, I can say that LARP is very unprofitable. It's almost fiendishly unprofitable. And I, that's why I love it. It's, it's, it's so anti-capitalist because it can't, it can't possibly make a profit. <laughs> People try, but it, it's very difficult. So, so you have to kind of exist in this space where it's just Zen and you just think, okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing this thing because I have other reasons other than trying to make money. And that tabletop is a little more profitable, but it's not even remotely profitable compared with video games. And so, so there's still a space of us saying, look, let's put money and, and uh, other factors aside and, and just play, right? And obviously that's not the case. Obviously there, there's lots of other elephants in the room when you play, but, but again, compared with video game access, I think it's, uh, it's pretty pretty democratic and, and fairly uh, open ended for everybody to have have input and a say into what's going on. So that's all I've got for you today. I can step in and talk about any specific issue you'd like. Yeah, that's fantastic. And thank you so much for giving us some kind of overviews of, of and I think it's really interesting to think about um, the productive nature of anger. And I would, I, I have tried to frame it as less something, someone is wrong on the internet, which is also an animating, you know, kind of research thing for me. So, but as like finding the places where human knowledge isn't paying attention closely to kind of think about history, to think about continuity, you know, um, Evan and I got into it on Twitter the other night because someone who's very active in the kind of live streaming producing side of things was like, are there any people who do like the history of actual play? And Evan like threw me under the bus and said, I guess I it guess it's my job now because no one else is really doing it yet. It's true. Um, 
Uh, but uh, but in order for me to be able to do it at all means that I have to kind of reach into your brain, you know, because you were the one who was like, well, prior to the performative turn in the 2000s or the almost the 2010s, there's this whole back history of how play was being performed, but in communities in these kind of pedagogical ways. And you knew about that. And luckily you've published about that. And there's a new book on actual play from McFarland that I can you know, can dig into, and it, it's, then this is how knowledge works, both in and out of the academy, right, like, um, you know, what I th love about talking to you, Evan, always is that part of your knowledge is happening in these kinds of academic spaces, but it's also drawing on that kind of oral tradition that, that, you know, people handing on and sharing expertise in those kinds of, you know, ways that we don't always acknowledge as being meaningful, um, when we talk about kind of citational politics and things like that. Um, yeah, I'll stop and, not I, 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 mattering, but. I think it's also important that I studied East German cinema in, in grad school because I, I you know, it, it's it's hard to, to study the losers of history, right? I mean, I mean, I, I, like very very bluntly, there are there are those who who um, you know sort of dominate the historical narrative and those who do not. And, and you watch how those voices are, are systematically ground out of the public discourse. And so suddenly oral history becomes this lifeline because pr the print history doesn't permit certain things to be said. Um, in RPGs, if you jump over to RPGs, uh, you can't write an authoritative book right now on indie tabletop RPGs. Like if you just said, oh, I'm gonna write the book on indie tabletop RPGs and then I'll publish it. Uh, that will anger so many people almost immediately. And, and it would be the same, it, you know, if an American uh, published the authoritative book on East Germany and said, this is, you know, the end all be all because they, you know, we weren't there. And, and of course, 70 years from now, you could, you could do that. But right now, all of that, all of those nerves are raw, they're open. And that's also the, the way it is with the RPG scene, you really have to navigate people's feelings, people uh, having been pushed out of communities or included in. And, um, and because I'm an event organizer, you saw the things I, I help organize over the years, that, that what that kind of means is that you you have to dive into the um, in, into the painful parts of the, the hobby as well. Because, you know, what what if if your your two largest um, constituents for your um, event, let's say, get into a, a long-term spat with each other, what do you do? How do you navigate? Yeah, no. <laughs> the real importance of Twitter beef when you're studying and working alongside living fallible humans, for, for sure. Um, so going to turn to some questions. Yep. Um, and uh, What's nice about your kind of overview is that you've kind of given us the pathway of how you moved through this space. So I don't need to ask that question, exactly. uh, which we often ask folks to get started. Um, so I'm going to start with the other most common question, because um, I think you can build on it in a bunch of different ways. But um, uh, what is your favorite gaming system? Oh, this is easy. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Okay, so my favorite gaming system is a Norwegian surrealist RPG called Itris B. Um, it, it, Itras City, I will put it in the chat if you want. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, it, Itris B um, uh, was created about a decade ago and is a, it's a card-based freeform tabletop RPG. Um, its main feature is that it has about three rules, but extensive world building. <laughs> Right. The three rules are, you know, if, if there's an outcome that's that's uh, dramatically uncertain, you draw from a deck that has, you know, it's filled with statements like yes and or no, but, it, you know, it is basic, basic improv prompts. Then there is a uh, surrealist deck and um, the surrealist deck is, um, when, you know, at, at, at certain points in the session, you can just draw from that and be like, oh, okay, suddenly a double of, of yours appears, and now you have to, like, deal with that, <laughs> or, you know, everything is now backwards, <laughs> right, and, and, and so it, 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 it does feel like, oh, we're just injecting in some improv challenges, but then the third rule comes in, which is that you, you, 
pretty much builds your your story around dramatic hooks. And so everyone has what's called an intrigue magnet, which is why does the universe care about you? And what's what's cool about that is you can create the most boring bureaucratic character. And as soon as they enter into Idris B, they are now in a Kafka-esque nightmare zone, right? Where it, it, they, they, they are a boring bureaucrat, but they are going to have a day. And it, it, you can play out the Stanley Parable or any number of, of, of surre surrealist weirdness. And you can actually have that sort of lonely fun if you want to or plug in other characters in which is cool because then it feels like a short story collection or an interesting like pan city narrative and uh because i'm such a cinema enthusiast i i really really dig kind of the the 1920s um almost silent cinema-esque era and i do have a a um a scenario for interest B in the big menagerie book that they per that they produced several years ago. Um, that is, is 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 effectively what it, what if you could get all the German you know expressionist like silent cinema characters together in in like an omnibus picture? What would that look like? Oh my gosh, that's amazing! So I'm going to flip this to the next question, which is kind of almost like the opposite question which is, do you have any examples of gaming systems that you like conceptually, but don't practically work well, or vice versa? Oh, yeah. Um, they're all over the place. I, I need to, um, let's see here. I need to pick a good punching bag. I'll pick two, okay? The first one is easy, which is, which is the world of darkness uh, systems. Actually, they, 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 this is very poignant. I'll, I'll double down on that. Um, so you're still beefing with vampire all these years later. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, my, my beef with vampire is deep because the wounds are deep. Um, the the uh, the fantasy is you all get to play sexy, cool vampires who are like separate from society and are having lots of angst. Oh bitterness! Oh to see the sun! And in practice, you are in this you know awful hierarchy where everybody is like preying off everybody else, and so you have to like double down on like the social skills you learned in high school, the bad ones, the ways that you need to bully someone in order to not be bullied yourself. And that, that to me is, is social poison. So that, that, that's one dimension, right? Is, is, is the, the, the general form kind of violates a lot of the basic vampire contracts. And that's where, you know, my, my, my kind of um, ideal vampire films are like the, lesbian vampire films of the 70s, like James Franco and, or sorry, um, uh, uh, Jesus Franco and, and uh, Daughters of Darkness and these kinds of films where, you know, it's all about this kind of sensuous pairing of these two women who then, you know, one is, one is the good girl who's actually not that good. And one is the seductress vampire who actually has a heart and, and it just, bringing them together and and you can't you can't tell those stories with with vampire the masquerade you can't even approach that uh the rules get in the way and the culture gets in the way um the i think other game that i i, I would say has great promise and doesn't deliver is a game called riddle of steel which uh by jake norwood this is an early forge game beautiful splat books and i actually love to run this game but it is a game that you can easily break just by increasing a character's strength stat. That's it. It has an elegant, like 100% like medieval simulation, uh, you know, where you, where you basically, you know, are like two mighty barbarians hewing each other on a dramatic island um, with, with realistic, you know, medieval wounding and everything, except that if you inc increase the strength stat, then everything uh goes away the, the the whole system breaks under that strain and i watched a player character in my campaign do exactly that um so uh to some degree you know the 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 the, the white wolf or world of darkness example is you know what happens when you've got a, a, a world that's just saturated with all of this meaning and and um and mood and character and then a system that has no idea what to do with that and then Riddle of Steel is, is like much more granular, right? Where they get everything right, but they missed one detail. That's one bug exploit that destroys the entire thing, right? But it can't, and, and so I guess the question is with, with the latter example, can it 
just not, is there no way to patch that? Is it a, like a flaw that's so fundamental to the mechanic that it can't be transformed? Yeah, you could, you could just say, no, no, you can't jack your strength stat beyond this certain point. But then that, that I, I said that, and that ended the campaign. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So, um, so, 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 so yeah, there's weird, there's weird social contracts about that stuff. <laughs> It's true. Um, it's so interesting to hear your thoughts on this compared to B. Dave, who, when we asked what his like starter role playing game was to introduce people to the hobby, he went to Vampire, and I was like, "What? Who? What now?" Because I played with high school jerks, right. and it seems like that's your argument as well. Is like it makes high school jerks of us all. Yeah, um, and, and, and I played before Vampire. I played Street Fighter, the storytelling game, also by White Wolf, and I love the shit out of that game. I thought that game was amazing. It's one of my favorite games. <laughs> so, uh, a related question: uh, My students are so smart today. Um, what are some identifiable characteristics of gaming systems that point to the system being well put together? Um, or, and also, are there some characteristics that can point to a system being underwhelming? Okay. Like, are there great. like red flags, green flags sort of features that you can, you, you've seen in your career? Yep. Yep. We do have criteria on this. So, I mean, again, because we run games, contests, and whatever, I, you know, you, you, you have to have some basis on which you judge the games, right? And, and it does have to be a kind of aesthetic sensibility. So I'll give you, again, a double-sided answer on this. One is I'm a convention GM. Can I sit down and play this game or run this game with very little prep? This is mm. this makes For the Queen look very, very good. And some of the more fiddly games like, you know, Fate of the Norns, very, very bad. Uh, you know, game games that, that require, um, you know, 50 different decisions uh, during character creation to make your intricate character that then, um, you know, you, you, you can't seem to get them out of the tavern because your fellow player just wants to, you know, hit on the guy who's giving you the mission. I mean, I mean, this is the, the kind of, you know, incoherence that is, that is not pleasant to deal with. So that's one criteria, which is, you know, is this immediately usable and can I run it without any real friction between the goals of the game and, and, um, and the actual play of the game. And uh, the, the second criteria is that kind of, again, poetic tension between what are the players doing and what is the overall vision of the activity. And, and this, is, this goes beyond you know, uh, in-game art or fiction or even mechanics to some degree, right? You can really do it without much in the way of mechanics. And you can also over-mechanize it and, and still have a, a really fun game as long as the, the, the pieces are shoving you towards the right kind of fiction. An excellent example of that is Burning Wheel by Luke Crane. Um, and Burning Wheel is a game that is very difficult to play, but each cog as it turns at least produces something that makes fictional sense where people are effectively you know, immolating themselves to get what they want. Right, that's that's all mechanically reinforced. So what we're looking for is um, aesthetic and mechanical reinforcement of the game's themes. Are you know, are 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 you uh, generating a you know dark and moody dungeon crawler? Well, then how how do I go into that dungeon? Uh, right, who what are we doing here? And um, you know, what is the art that shows us going into that dungeon? All all of those are. Are, you know, play together um, for the game. Um, I'm going to post a link here from the the old the old order of what we called the Power 19, which is uh, 19 questions a game designer should ask themselves when they are starting a game. And the the uh, the big three are the first three questions, which is what is your game about? What do the characters do? And what do, do the players, including the GM, who's also a player, do? Yeah, Period. I mean, that, that's yeah, it. The big three is part of every um, evaluation that we've got in our cluster assignments for uh, play testing. And so, yeah, no, so, but the, I had not expanded out to the, the, the power 19, so. Yeah, and, and, and the power 19 is getting granular, but again, if you can't answer the big three, then everything, starts to, to collapse. And, and that's when different other incentives 
uh, enter the room. So if we keep back bringing up our punching bag, White Wolf, uh, that that is um, a game that's trying to produce big, gorgeous splat books that have background lore that you want to buy, but also like in-game advantage that you can also you know mobilize. Oh, I read this text that has this power. Can I use this power in the game? Right. That that that, that very basic transaction, and. So what, what you're doing is you are, you are adding a bunch of gunk to the gears of whatever that system is um, in, 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 in favor of some sort of fictional or mechanical advantage. And then you, know, you, you don't quite get a very clear story that comes out of it. So um, you know, For the Queen is very well designed because it's kind of a half RPG, right? You, you have just enough to sort of to start telling a story, but it's very ambiguous, and that's part of the game. And you, you, you sort of spend as much uh, energy as possible um, uh, to to kind of uh, build something shared together that that you know comes from nowhere, right? Just comes from these loaded questions. The Quiet Year, which you all played, uh, is also again a bunch of loaded questions, but that's not a game. That's a game about how community breaks down. And if you have took any contempt tokens as you played, you'll notice you. that, that. Yes. <laughs> so that, 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 I mean, Avery Alder, um, who designed that game, is extremely skeptical about community. Uh, she believes that, that communities norm and destroy certain values and certain forms of independence and certain forms of independent thinking. And uh, the quiet year is a good expression of that. And so, you know, when when you're thinking, what is my game about? What are the players doing? What are you know the characters doing? Well, in the quiet year, the game is about you know how communities like form, do things, are kind of awful and die. And uh, the characters are not don't really exist, right? You're just sort of amorphous stuff that emerges but you're not playing a character per se which again abstracts to the community level and then what are the players doing the players are drawing they're following the prompts and then they're also physically drawing the map and at that point then uh it becomes a spatial narrative so i think you know for any design you can sit down and try and answer the big three and if you can't or if there there's mechanics especially that are in the way saying okay our objective is to have grand adventures but first we need to see what your strength stat is yeah there's <laughs> always already a question okay why do i have a strength stat why do i have six stats what are these for why why do i have these numbers but the only thing that matters is that they give you like a plus two or a minus one but you you begin to ask so many questions maybe too many questions of of the games that, that you're familiar with um, so a kind of related set of questions. Um, I think we've talked about this before, Evan, but about a quarter to a third of the class are future teachers. And so we've got questions about um, both, and I'll put them together and you can kind of mix and match as you wish. Um, suggestions, advice for future teachers who want to bring RPGs into the classroom, uh, and relatedly advice suggestion specifically on LARP um, in the classroom. Um, so if you've looked at anything I've published recently, I, in the past five years, I, I have publications on teaching literature through LARP and teaching through RPGs in general. Um, the main party line that I um, advance is that games cannot just fulfill your curricular <laughs> goals. Uh, they, 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 they have something more to them. And part of it is embracing that emergence without getting in trouble and uh, without, without diverging too far from your curricular goals. So I uh, ran a role-playing game in the spring. That was the, you know, the absolute mess. That was the 1492 papal election. And we had about 50 players, mostly playing remotely and, and you know, sending each other sort of remote messages, um, trying to scheme and get their, you know, um, get, get their positions advanced. Um, the outcome of that game was that they just, you know, chose the Medici, the very guy that the, <laughs> they just, they, they chose the absolute, the, the historical guy who, 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 
won that election, uh, you know, in the end. And, and again, I was, I was the game facilitator. So it was a history seminar, but I was running, you know, I was running all the back um, area. If someone wanted to stab somebody or somebody wanted to give money to somebody, I was there to facilitate that as a game master. Um, what I discovered was, you know, um, there's a lot of inertia that, that, that the pandemic has, has created. And so it's very difficult to get people to care. And that also when, when, they say they say to the Medici's. No, I mean the Borgia. Says our Borgia. I, I, I was I, I I can't believe I I got the two uh, antagonistic families. Of, but anyway, the Borgia. The yeah, that was that was that was my screw up. I'm I'm not thinking straight today. But the the um the the, the lesson I got from from that was was those students who did engage had an incredibly powerful experience. Those students were 10% of my students in that class. And 90, what, what happened to the 90%, right? So, so my, my first major bit of advice is think about the 90% first, right? How can you guarantee a minimal experience that still works, that still somewhat advances towards the curriculum goals, but is still like a little interesting in terms of emergence for those 90%, right? Where people are like, I have to what? I have to create a character? Okay. Uh, I'm going to get lost after I do step three of 20, right? So you, th you, have, you have to really think, okay, how many rules do I really need to run this game? What is the barest minimum number of rules I need? And without those rules, then how do I contain what I unleash, right? If you're running a game like Diplomacy, um, where people are making uh, diplomatic treacher treachery all the time, right? That, that they make a deal with, with one person and say one thing, but then they make a shit secret other deal with somebody else. That's a lot of fun, right? Except it's not very fun for the person who's getting screwed over. And then that, how do you manage those feelings, right? You can't, you, you could just throw up your arms and say, oh, it, that was all fun, right? It, actually, it, you know, you, you really, really do need to pay attention to what are the specific behaviors you are incentivizing. What are your players doing? Even the ones that are not doing much of anything. And how do you get those players who are not doing much of anything to do at least a marginal something towards your goal? I think that's 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 where I'm at. So so you know, games like For the Queen, but others um, of a similar variety in the sort of story game category work well because they have so few rules. But even those with so few rules still have too many rules. Uh, in my opinion, in my opinion, so so really, you know, paring things down to a very specific, concentrated experience that doesn't take too long is is good. But if you're going to run a, a more extended campaign, then you need to figure out how to get long term buy in from the people who will sit in the back of the class and do nothing. Unfortunately, yeah, I mean, and it's us, a lot of my colleagues are are very invested in reacting to the past, which is going to be brought into that they're now writing it was designed for higher ed but is now they're creating books that are designed for high school use um so it's trickling down kind of the the educate i don't it's not down it's going to younger uh potential audiences but so much of that is about project management is like you know that you have to build in writing assignments or you have to build in kind of reflection and all this sort of thing to make this big multi-day often multi-week kind of experience work and yeah these kind of tight story games like for the queen and the quiet ear work precisely because you can kind of get them done um our next uh, our next game is is uh well i guess another way to think about it is what are the games that you found to be most successful as one shots for um kind of when you you know when you've run stuff at origins and gen con and stuff like that the ones um, that you kind of pick up and go my, my favorite is is the larp called first impressions uh that's called that's dungeons and dragons speed dating i can run it in 45 minutes um everybody get, makes up a character like one two three go you know i'll be a dwarf fighter i'll be a halfling henchman and then and then you you just pair up and then everyone has like two or three minutes to get to know each other and you like your backstory is like you know what are you known for and what's your like cool magical thing that you own and 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 the only thing you're trying to do is figure out like which one of these 
people will I accept into my party when I form my party? And then at the end, you you say, okay, you know, there, there's there's a voting thing where you you secretly hand tokens to people, um, which can be handled pretty much at any class size, and then. Um, the person with most tokens then gets to form the party and the rest of the people get to go and, and talk to that shady elf in the corner who's giving out assignments. Again, I can run it in under an hour, including debrief. I run, I run it in Second Life actually as part of the Slarp Fest regularly. And so that's my, my go-to game because everybody knows D&D. This is using D&D for something else, <laughs> for speed dating. And that it's a lot of fun to get to know people in this kind of short role-playing, very low stakes capacity. There's no romance involved, right? It's just for speed dating for your adventuring party. So you're asking questions like, how do you dungeon? I dungeon this way, right? You know, uh, Do you like to split the treasure with the most valuable member of the party who's obviously me, right? And then, and then, and then you get these personality registers. And what, what, what happens is, uh, and again, the incentives there are the henchman always wins because they're the most useful to everybody. Ah. It, it, it's a space where the subs always win, the doms get shoved out. That's the, that's the. Boom, boom. Yeah. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. No, that I, I can see how that kind of game would be very effective very quickly and, and connect but, but, to other games. That, 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 that's really important is, is to play a bunch of games right now while you've got you're younger and have a lot of time because then when you're older and have kids like me, you like crave that time where you were at, where you had that that available but what it also means is that when you run or play games you can see how people react to them you can see the responses you can see what kind of social system you're creating and when you're teaching in a classroom you're always creating a social system so what you know what what are people getting rewarded for what are they getting punished for what do they tend to do in that in that uh, circumstance and always watching for that in any game you you play or run is important for becoming a good teacher with games. Yeah, I'm a good teacher in period end of sentence. I mean, it sounds like, I mean, we often talk about gamifying the classroom, but really the classroom already has kind of implicit rules. And this is something that we've talked about a lot in this, in this class. Um, so I want to pivot us um, at the moment uh, to kind of starting to think about Thursday and to talk a little bit about um, kind of the process of, you know, academic work uh, and evaluating other people's work, figuring out how to kind of make a cohesive, you know, curated special issue of the kind, like the one that just went live on Analog uh, Game Journal is um, was all invitation, was all people being asked to contribute. Um, right. uh, uh, have there been open calls that you've participated in before? And how do you figure out when you don't know the people in their work before, how do you decide what's potentially strong? Okay, so... Um... When we have open calls, uh, we, we, we tend to have fewer and fewer of them now because um, they aren't well uh, submitted to right now. I don't know why, but, but we, don't, we, don't, we don't get a lot of submissions when we do open calls. We get, we get much more submissions if we just say, hey, we're available. And then, then and people ha like pitch us ideas. So um, they, they will send us you know, a short abstract, just like you know, you're rece receiving for post 45. And we kind of then vibe with the abstract. Uh, one of the main, main goals uh, of, of us reviewing the abstracts is to see if we are going to get a viable piece that will be non-boring for anyone to read. And I say this because, you know, academic treatises tend towards not only the boring, but also uh, towards points that don't need to be made. And, mm. and, and, and so my eyes will glaze over when someone writes me, you know, an abstract thing like role-playing games are a legitimate art form and good for storytelling. And I, I'm like, I, yeah, I, I, I know I read books too. And I find, right. It just, it's like, well, yes, I, I, I am a role-playing journal and I, I, I understand that that's, that's what, <laughs> what, what, you, what you're doing there. So, so what I'm looking for to avoid that is specificity. Someone says, here is the conversation I'd like to have. Here's the evidence I'm drawing from, and here's the conversation I'd like to have. When we got the Fiend Folio pitch, it was, it was attractive because it's concentrating on one book 
one influential book and one that has a complicated history, especially messy considering how little anyone got paid and how wide ranging that impact is. So it's basically a book in which, you know, uh, first of all, uh, we can see the fallout between TSR and Games Workshop, so a sort of industry level history. But then you also see that these are like 16 year olds, you know, drawing stuff or coming up with monsters in their notebooks. And you can immediately identify with that as anybody, right? And, 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 and then imagine your notebook thing is then played by like thousands or even millions of players worldwide for 40 years, and you see not a penny from that. Just think about it, right? Yeah, it says so. There's, yeah, so immediately, right? You know, when we when we saw, oh, we want to do Fiend Folio. I'm like, okay, our imagination runs wild. We now, and and again, our imagination can only run wild because we already know stuff about the Fiend Folio. So that's why game literacy is important, right? Is because if you if someone pitches you something, and you're like, I don't know that game. I don't know that person. I don't know, right? You, you don't know what to do with it. But it, if you're already diving in and saying, okay, this is this is the story they want to tell with this specific object that's that's terrific so i guess always look for the specific over the general and look for the um the framing how do they frame the argument right what are the stakes um if i if i argue this thing what's the outcome of that or what 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 does that mean <laughs> And um, it doesn't need to be world shattering. Most arguments aren't, you know, you're not going to end capitalism with your article, but you will be able to make a little dent. And, it, and when I talk about non-boring, if it's, if it's engagingly written, if it, it captures our interest, then we, we also think this 300 word piece of writing is a sample of what we'll later get. And, and we can then say this is a microcosm or sample of, of like their full um, submission. And, and that, that, that's where we go for. We, you know, is this engagingly written? And does this have a point that's specific enough that we can say they, they argued it? And that goes for anybody. It's not just academics. It doesn't have to be an academic point. It can be a design point. We, that, that can also be a thing. Yeah, no, I think that's really useful. In fact, so much so that like whatever device you have that you've got out, if you have not made a note, this is your reading task for Thursday is to take a look at these pitches with this eye for which ones are the top 10. Um, and each table will basically create a list of their top 10 uh, in class on Thursday. And I think that's a really good rubric to have in mind is which are the ones that are most specific? Which are the ones that are grabbing us with its language already? Um, and which seem to be making a meaningful point as opposed to one that feels already kind of, we, if, if you guys as total newbies in this space are like, we've heard this before, then that's a really good litmus test. I think that's fair to say. Um, yep. So you guys are gonna be the first, well, not the very first eyes, I've obviously seen these, but I have done no culling. I've, I've cut down only um, the ones that didn't have uh, praises, did not have abstracts at all. Um, so you've got about 30 ish to take a look at. They're all short. They're not, they had a character limit. So they're like very, they're very, they're very short, but uh, you get to take a look at those. And so we'll talk about those. So, yeah. yeah. So um, in terms of your own work, um, the Michigan now has this new um, series and that's also how books in academia how ideas start to circulate is when you're proposing, when you're writing an academic book, you often look for a book series to be part of so that your book gets marketed. So you see me wave around my McFarland book, um, the book that I have an essay, the essay about critical role that you guys have read. And that's because McFarland has made a uh, kind of a name for itself as being the kind of uh, one's willing to take on a lot of stuff in game studies that a lot of other publishers don't touch. MIT does it to a certain extent, although their first, second, and third person anthologies are now woefully out of date. Um, and uh, which means they're hard to want, to, they're designed as textbooks, but they are impossible to, assume. you've read a lot of uh, stuff in the first part of the semester from those collections, but I could not justify making you buy them. 
And so now Michigan, the is it University of Michigan or is it Michigan State? I forget. Oh, University of Michigan, yeah. Thank you. So University of Michigan Press has now entered the fray with, as I understand it, the pitch literally was to create the 33 and a third series for games. So if you're not familiar with 33 and a third, and why should you? There are, it's a great book series. It's little tiny books, almost the size of a CD that are into, that are books that are all about one album. And so an academic or, you know, and, and some non-academics have written them. Basically, it's so popular to write for that like they have a, only a period of a very narrow window of the year where you can pitch new 33 and the third books in that series because everyone wants to write about their favorite album, right? right. Um, and it has to be, it doesn't necessarily have to be the most famous album, although that helps, but it has to be an important kind of narrative, uh, something that opens up the way that Evan's been talking about. So now Michigan's trying to do that with games, but it sounds like, so you're the only role-playing game in this first like uh, season of, of uh, contracts. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think, um, uh, yeah, we, I think we got Gloomhaven, Wingspan, uh, Carcassonne, uh, effectively a lot of the, the establishment board games. And you know, this has to do with, I think, uh, Paul Booth being firmly in board game studies and Aaron Trammell being mostly a Dungeons and Dragons scholar. So they're going to edge towards the history of war gaming and board gaming, whereas I'm more in the history of, you know, dressing up like a fairy and playing pretend, it is, which is where my role playing comes from, is basically action figures and dressing up. But, I, you know, for me, uh, it's a, um, you know, like it, it, it's a certain decision, and and I'm glad I can be included in that because I think for me, my goal with the book is to win audience for Apocalypse World and for the appreciation of what we call now call the powered by the apocalypse system, which pervades pretty much everything uh, that's coming out now, uh, which uh, in, in in RPGs with with with, with its context, which it came from a very specific design moment. And it evolved over time. It had a second edition. Um, it came from also a moment where both Vincent and Meg were co-developers on that game, and only Vincent's name was on there, and and that didn't work. And Vincent said that didn't work, and so he added Meg to the to the equation. And and that's important because Meg is a sex educator and uses practices of you know sexual consent to structure these these moves right the that, that are the core of a pbta game and so i'd like to tell the story of how you know sort of this this couple in greenfield mass cracked the code of rpgs and used sexual consent as a, its main core engine but of course you know it, it all consent doesn't have to be sexual. It can be quite non-sexual. And, 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 and in fact, when you're, when you're having a conversation in RPG, you know, it's, it's like, okay, I consent to this being, to, to this existing in the fiction or not. And uh, the, those acts of consent are, are important. And before Apocalypse World were much more implied and not explicit. So. Yeah. That, and now that, we that, have safety tools and discourse around safety tools and all kinds of uh, you know, meta mechanic sort of right. uh, conversations. Um, and this ties into a question that um, the students had on Mentimeter, um, which I think is a, is a good place to come to now, which is uh, the, the question was phrased as um, uh, how do you see role playing games moving from niche to mainstream? And I guess the question is do you think that that's what's happening? Um, you know, is, is that where we're going? Because I know you and I have been thinking about it in terms of like the academic study of this stuff. There's big digital, like we were talking uh, the other day about we need an international movie database for live streamers because there's so many live streams and there's so many people, you know, who are involved in labor and we'd love to be able to track all of that. Who's going to fund it? Right, you know, and if it go, if you get say Wizards of the Coast, if you go to Wizards of the Coast and say, hey, 
Would you give us some money to, you know, then it's going to become all about Dungeons and Dragons, right? And then that leaves off an enormous part of the story. But if you go to the National Endowment for the Humanities, like the federal funding, how do you make that argument? And I, and that's a question that I've been facing. And so I, I vomit all of that up and have, and want you to kind of think about that out loud. <laughs> yeah, I can do that. Uh, the, the internet age has created an environment where niche um, subcultures can easily impact uh, the mainstream. And in fact, the mainstream has been, been so hollowed out by finance capital that it relies on subcultures to, to you know, enhance, you know, its, its um, uh, profile. And we saw this happen in the 1980s with uh, co-opting of punk, um, later, later of comic books, which again used to be pretty both considered, you know, youth fiction and juvenile and underground, but that shifted. And uh, again, finance capital is always looking for new places to park itself. So it, it is now firmly backed subcultures. But uh, this is where we, we get a very awkward relationship between what we consider to be the mainstream, which is again, massively corporate funded kind of media structures and uh, the indie, which is on to some degree, you know, getting um, it's, you know, get, get, get making a design impact, getting different brands through. People are able to make their living in ways that they couldn't have imagined earlier. Um, are like ind independent RPG makers through Patreon, through Kickstarter, through uh, other funding instr instruments are now making a lot more than they used to. Um, it used to, it, and, and it used to be, I think, a lot more financially precarious. Um, Gary Gygax lost the rights to Dungeons and Dragons because in the 1970s, it was expensive to print books. That's literally how he lost <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons. He needed some other people involved and they, they exercised their stake in, in, the, um, in the process in the early 80s. So uh, the, 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 these questions are fundamental, right? Um, you know, what is materially supporting your art? So now we get in, in, in between the tension between corporate media, which um, kind of hates having a history because then it can't get you to buy the new thing, right? So, you know, we, we always want to like erase the, the original so that, that whatever the new version of it is, you'll buy that. <laughs> And like, if you have nostalgia for the old thing, that's fine. But do I have rights to sell you the old thing? If I do, yes, I'll sell you the old thing and the new thing. But otherwise, I'm going to erase the history of the old thing, which is why you need cultural institutions, libraries, museums, archives. Uh, and strangely enough, books have those things. And movies have those things and comics have those things you see what i'm saying why what what happens with role playing games which are equally powerful as all those other media i mean they they, they exist along a various con a continuum right and so now suddenly you are in the cultural resources game you have to decide what is is or isn't artistically valuable what is or isn't worth preserving and what then um is or isn't preserving if it's made a cultural impact on like less than 300 people, right? <laughs> Which is most indie RPGs. And at the same time, um, some of those, such as The Quiet Year, have, got, have broken through and made it. Well, that's because Avery Alder is on her hustle. She, you know, promoted this game quite heavily as a, you know, means of of educating people, which good on her. I mean, it's a great game for that. She recognized the value of what what she had and put it forth um, in in every means available. So now she is effectively quasi an educator in addition to a game designer. Um, and 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 that's the reality is is that you once you get into the cultural institutions, then you're you're dealing with pretty large monoliths of you know education and law and uh you know military training any number of areas where where role-playing games might apply um and you know as, as soon as you're in that uh situation you ask where where's the money going to come from and uh right now the current flow of money in role-playing games is that people in tech make a lot of money and then they go and they hand it 
to their artistic friends or they hand it to 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 the artists right and 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 that 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 you, you redistribute the tech money to the to the uh uh, geek artist community, and that that's the current uh, way it's working. I don't know, I I I don't know if we want to keep living in that world, but it's definitely how it works right now. Um, and uh, which also which also means that you can have ultra valuable streams, uh, multi million dollar streams, because there are people who are geeks who have that kind of money to to spend, and they will spend it. And at the same time. That's not the majority of geeks. Most of the majority of us are, are poor and, and, and are scraping by and are not, you know, not doing so well. And uh, but what do we what do we do, you know, with that with that sort of creation? So I guess you know to to, to answer the the question about mar mar mainstream and marginal, right? It is a question of material resources, and things will become more mainstream as cultural resources you know, back this kind of folk art, but they have to, they have to be there. And uh, if we don't have those resources, then much of this stuff will be lost. And I should also say it's going to get eaten up by the private market. I mean, you know, all these indie RPGs from the mid 2000s, where they have print runs of like 300 or 500, no ISBNs. I mean, they, we just created a giant back market of collector's items in 20 years. I mean, shit, what did we just do that for? We just created a bunch of money for other people and not ourselves. What, what, are, what are we doing, right? So yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't know either. I mean, because I was, you know, based on that conversation that you and I had publicly on Twitter, some folks went into my DMs and we had these interesting conversations about what do I mean about the professionalizing turn um, that I seem to keep seeing, at least in terms of streaming, but also I think in terms of, you know, at least some part of the well, like there's this really weird tension between professional and amateur fan and, you know, fan enthusiast and, you know, and that there's not a whole lot of compassion for people who would actually like to make a living off of their, their labor. Right. Um, it's, it's, it's all a Wild West show in ways that remind me of the 18th century, which is why I'm here. Yes, um, but I'm so glad to have had you have a chance to talk to our students. They have been literally on the edges there of their seats. I've seen. Um, hopefully, this has been a generative conversation. Let's thank Evan Turner for coming to class. And I have so many tabs uh, open now to add to Canvas of things that Evan has mentioned in class. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and well, I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll talk soon. And and I and everybody, you have a unique and wonderful opportunity here. Don't blow it. Do a do a great do a do, do this is this is this is a a a kind of once in a lifetime class. Uh, and, Not, and, but, and, uh... That's that's what I have to say. I, you know, I, I can't teach that class, and and I'm jealous. But but at the same time, it means you have to treat uh, Dr. Friedman extra well. Glad I got that on the recording. Thank you so much, Evan. Nope. You are Take a care. treasure. It's so good to work with you. Bye. Bye. -bye.